Cecile Enright is the founder of River's Edge Academy Charter School, REACH, which she launched in 2011 with 70 students in a leased church space in rural Rogue River, Oregon. Today, the school serves over 200 students in two locations, including a large freestanding building in Grants Pass, Oregon, and a smaller rented space of a community center in Rogue River. REACH is a K-12 hybrid charter school, enabling students to be on campus for part of the week and to learn from home or in the community for the remainder of the week, often taking enrichment classes in areas such as art, music, and 4-H with local community partners. As a charter school, REACH students attend tuition-free. I had the chance to meet Cecile and visit REACH during my visit to Southern Oregon earlier this spring. Cecile Enright, thank you so much for being on the Liberated Podcast. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. I I have to say, ever since finding your book and reading it and uh, encouraging my staff members to read it also, it's just got me reignited for why I got into charter school world and the innovation that we need to continue in the United States and specifically in Southern Oregon. Well, thank you for that. I was so honored to hear that you had found my book and that you had shared it with your staff members at REACH. It was just such an honor and and, and also an honor to meet you and meet many of them during my visit. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about why you decided to create this charter school back in 2011. What was going on for you, you know, kind of personally, professionally that motivated you to do that? So there's a bit of history. I started in education, being really involved in it back in the 90s when my children were in school. And there were only three choices in Oregon. You could homeschool private school or public school. Those were your choices. And I started seeing a real gap, especially so for those families that are trying to work and trying to homeschool their kiddos. There were kids that were falling through the cracks and there were families that weren't being served. And so started. I actually first started the idea back in 2004 and started working towards the process of becoming a charter school. Uh, Charter school law in Oregon is not the most friendly to work with. And so trying to find a um, a viable sponsor was one of the biggest challenges. Uh, And we were able to find one in 2010 and applied for the state grant for a charter school startup and went to a board meeting with Rogue River School District uh, board members, and they liked our proposal. So then the fall started rolling forward and got things going, and we opened the fall of 2011. And what was the landscape like for hybrid hybrid charter schooling back then? I know this is something that California um, has pioneered. Uh, There's a couple in uh, Oregon, but what was it like back in 2011? (laughs) It was not friendly at all. Um, The idea of hybrid schools is still misunderstood in Oregon. Uh, Back in 2005, uh, the first fully online charter school opened, and I actually happened to be at the Oregon Department of Ed helping to read uh, grant applications, and there was a big hubbub about how they were going to require parents to participate in their child's education, and they were like, oh, you can't require this, Uh, but we know based on research Students that have involved parents perform better overall on any type of standardized assessment, or they perform better when they go on into adulthood and into their career options. So it was it was very um, unstable grounds. It it and it still is. They have laws that approve online schools, and they have laws that approve. Um, traditional brick and mortar charter schools, but there's nothing really for the hybrid model. So we kind of run under the radar in many ways. We we use portions of the online schools to monitor what we do, and we use 
portions of the brick and mortar and try to find the best fit and the best, best match. I will say we have a wonderful sponsor in school district. Yeah. And that seems to be mostly your motivation is making sure that every child and every family has the educational environment that's right for them, that they're able to kind of pick and choose the curriculum that's right for them, that they have that freedom and flexibility in education. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your background and how you came to be interested in education more generally and kind of your experience leading up to 2011. So my experience leading up to 2011, I had, um, I actually pulled one of my youngest sons from traditional school and homeschooled him for a while, while I was a single mom and working part-time. He was in eighth grade. And one of the things he'll say, mom, I didn't really learn anything that year. And going, oh, yes, you did. You knew, you learned how to be self-directed. You knew how to ask questions. You learned how to be you know, an independent learner. And now you even say, mom, I'm always learning. And he's a very successful businessman. Prior to 2011, I, I just, it was that gap of those kids that weren't being served in these families that needed something more. Uh, public school is not the right fit for every child. I have, I always go back to my own children. I have four children. All four of them have different learning needs. Each one of them, two of them were successful in traditional school. Two of them were not. And they ended up doing, one did a GED, one did an alternative school setting. And they're all four successful adults. I love to brag about one of my daughters who's a CPA. And then I have another one that we had a computer in the 90s, which was not usual for families to have one but we had picked up some used ones and my son rebuilt it so that we had a personal computer at home. And he is still an IT specialist. Amazing. So how does reach work, right? I mean, you said you wanted something that was going to be more flexible for families, that was going to kind of fill that gap for families who may have liked the autonomy of homeschooling, but there were kind of practical limitations for them in, in many ways. So how does REACH kind of close that gap? How does it work? So REACH offers, one, we label ourselves as a personalized learning school. So that means we do our best to design the curriculum with the parents involved and finding what matches best because one size does not fit all. We've had students that come to us and they don't come until they're ready for college or their high school and they'll be coming in and we partner with our community college and we've had a student graduate with his diesel mechanic degree. We've had a student graduate with an automotive technician degree with in partnership with our community college. We also have students that are highly active in dance and in the arts. And they're able to put all the time that they want to into practicing and refining their, their gift and their talents and have that flexible schedule. So the parents help align and find the right curriculum for their children. Curriculum is not, it's not a textbook specific. And sometimes we get into this hole where we think, oh, I have to buy a textbook or I have to buy a workbook. That's not the curriculum. The curriculum is the standards and we do align with Oregon standards. And then you find how you're going to meet the standards. We also know with the number of standards we have in Oregon and many other states in the United States, you never hit all the standards you pick what we call the power standards or the anchor standards. And that's what the focus is. And finding if one student is wanting to do dance through a local vendor, or they want, uh, we have had students that were musicians and talented musicians uh, that have been able to focus on practicing their instrument. And we had one talented young man, um, just a gifted cellist 
<laughs> and you, you think, oh, cellist. Well, we don't see that much anymore, but there are talented young people that really want to focus on their gifts, their talents. And then we take the curriculum to meet the standards for language arts and tie it together. We take math and implement that into a way that makes sense. I will say I've been using a, a certain type of math for over 20 years and I really believe in it because I know if the kids go through that, they test into college level math every time. I won't say which one it is at the moment. Oh, it's okay. Please, yes, no, we, we, we always love tips. I, I love Saxon math. Yeah. It's it's um it spirals, it keeps building upon itself, and it's always going back and looking at the skills that were already taught that they can continue to practice it. And I've used that since the 90s, and I know it's tried and true. So as a charter school that's tuition free for families, uh, it's a public school privately run. Um there are certain requirements that you have to meet that say an independent private school wouldn't have to. So obviously you have to align with state standards. What are other requirements in the part of families or learners to be a part of REACH? So we uh, also do benchmark assessments. Our current tool that we use is iReady. It's nationally normed, people recognize it, and it gives us a good idea where the students are so that we can target that instruction to help them get the growth that they need to achieve, right? Then we also have state assessments. The state assessment, um, it's called OSAS, Oregon State uh, Assessment of Learning and Skills, and that is aligned with Smarter Balance. The unique thing we do have in Oregon is our legislators, when Smarter Balance first came in, there was so much pushback for it that our legislators decided that parents could opt out of that. And so they can opt out of the math and the language arts. They can't opt out of science. And one thing that kind of gets a little confusing, I also do homeschool testing I will always be a proponent for homeschool or parent choice, whether it is private. Um, there are so many pods. There's so many little, little startups in Southern Oregon that parents are being innovative. And I want to support that. Oregon homeschool testing rules are third, fifth, eighth, and 10th grade. And I continue to do that next three weeks, I will be really busy doing my full-time job and doing homeschool testing. Mm -hmm. So I had Sean Harrell, who's the president of uh, Integration Charter Schools in Staten Island, New York, on the podcast uh, a couple of months ago and was asking him about charter schools being able to still be innovative and experimental, kind of the vision of charter schools uh, mm -hmm. back when they first began to be introduced in the 1990s. Uh, and he was optimistic. He said, you know, we look for the gray area and the regulations. That's where the beauty is. That's where we're able to innovate uh, and do those experimental things. Do you agree with that? Do you feel like there's still room in the charter space for uh, experimentation and innovation? I do. It's It gets harder and harder each year because they put more requirements on the charter schools. But we do, you know, finding ways to still meet the requirements, but being able to meet the needs of students is huge. And it is really sometimes challenging when we get teachers coming from the traditional education training model. I'd rather, I personally would rather take a brand new teacher because they haven't been inundated on what they have to do in the traditional school setting than taking a teacher that has 10 years experience because they have a hard time making that shift to being innovative. They go, well, I don't, I need your permission to do this. And it's like, mm, no, you don't. <laughs> you have the freedom. You are the professional and you have the tr freedom to find what fits. I, I sent a group to another school here recently. And the word that they all picked out that they were told from another charter school is it's messy. 
And you have to be okay with things being a little messy sometimes, Mm. because that's how you get to what that child needs. And also working with that parent and building the relationships. It's, oh, it's my passion. I don't know if you could tell. And it's such a worthy passion, so important for the families that you're serving. You now serve over 200 students, but another constraint as part of the charter world is your growth is limited by charter enrollment caps where you're not allowed to grow above a certain amount each year. You know, if you didn't have those caps, (laughs) what do you think uh, your growth rate would look like? Oh, our growth rate would be huge. And we saw that especially during the pandemic when parents were looking for something different and looking for options for their kids. Uh, You know, we had been hybrid long before uh, the the U.S. turned to hybrid learning and online learning. We had already been doing that. We knew what we were doing. And so parents were attracted to us. Currently, our enrollment is very stable. I know some of the online charter schools have had some declining enrollment because families are going back to traditional setting or they're choosing to do private. Ours has increased every year and will continue to increase. And I think we could grow to 500 students very easily if that was allowed, Mm. but we are only allowed to grow by 10% per year based on our charter contract. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's why we're seeing uh, a real growth of other education entrepreneurship in the Rogue Valley area around Mm -hmm. Grants Pass, which is where I visited. Um, You being one of those kind of early innovators, permissionless innovators in the Valley, and now I think inspiring so many others to do the same. Uh, There's clearly a lot of parent demand for unconventional out of system education models. And you mentioned, um, Cecile, that, you know, you have this wonderful cellist was a student of yours, and you have these really talented students who find the flexibility of the hybrid charter uh, to be really valuable in kind of pursuing their interests and talents. What are some other reasons why families uh, come to you and come to reach? What, what are, what's driving them? Um, some of it has, happens to be really political in our state, but it has to do with the sexuality standards and parents really not wanting that to be taught to their children. And within our setting, we can give them some safe ways that they're in control. Uh, again, we still have to meet the standards but they're seeing what the standards are and they have more of a say in how those standards are presented to their children. And that is huge for families. Yeah, one of the things that really struck me about um, the Rogue Valley, this beautiful area of Southern Oregon, is that there is a a real independent spirit, it seems, among the families. really a focus on self-reliance, on entrepreneurship. I was surprised at just how much uh, entrepreneurship is happening there, not only in education, but in other areas as well. Can you tell us a little bit about the Rogue Valley from your perspective? You've been there for a long time. You know, what do you find so special about it? Well, one of the things I actually had talked, spoke with somebody in the 90s through the employment department, and we were having a conversation about different options that were available. And they said the Rogue Valley and Southern Oregon at large has the highest number of entrepreneurial spirit and small businesses than they do throughout the state. And it is because of that independent mindset. And we see that through education. We see that through businesses. We see it throughout Southern Oregon. It's huge. And this really is a, a rural part of the state. It's several hours south of Portland, um, kind of close to the California border. Uh, and it really does focus on um, this kind of entrepreneurial spirit and this focus on small businesses. So what are what are you most excited about now in seeing how REACH fits into this larger ecosystem of education entrepreneurship, these Uh, innovative parents and teachers who are launching micro schools and learning pods and homeschool collaboratives. Uh, What do you think about that trend? 
Oh, I think it's going to continue to grow, in, especially in Southern Oregon. So one little other piece I would like to share about Southern Oregon. Southern Oregon at one point in time was looking along with a portion of Northern California becoming um, the state of Jefferson. And, and that, again, attests to the independent spirit in Southern Oregon. Um, more recently, they have tried to do um, what's called Greater Idaho because they want to be that independent and have more control and more say over what's happening for their education, for their businesses, and for their lifestyle. It's just, it's a huge area for the, the independence, I should say. Yeah, independence autonomy. And one of the other things that really struck me, though, was that there's a lot of emphasis on kind of child centered learning. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's these new micro schools and pods that have arisen over the past few years. But even prior to that, there were uh, some established Montessori private schools and Waldorf private oh, schools yes. and Waldorf charter schools. Um, why is that? I mean, it's just such an interesting phenomenon in this rural corner of the country to have a focus already on alternative education. It's just it's it's something that we've seen as a need and it's a driving force. We don't want to look like everybody else. And that is the Southern Oregon spirit. We want to be able to do things differently. And having that freedom is really important to this Southern Oregon community. I have lived in Southern Oregon since 91. I am also a transplant from California. <laughs> I have to own that. Uh, and I still consider myself an Oregonian. I lived in Oregon the first time in 79, and I kept coming back. And since 91, I haven't left. Uh, and that's what you find, too, in Southern Oregon is once people land here, they don't want to leave. So they want to bring a way to educate their family, their student, their kids, um, support themselves, because there's not a high level of salaries in the Southern Oregon either. It's a lower income community. I'm going to say about 60% poverty rate in Southern Oregon. So people are trying to find ways to live and have that freedom and that independence and being able to have ownership of their own child's education. One of the schools that you didn't get to see that would have been really neat for you to see is called the Dome School. It's been around since the 70s. And it was started actually by a bunch of hippies. So um, it, it's just it, it's just that I don't know how to explain it. It is just the environment for Southern Oregon. So what do you see as the future of these sort of unconventional education models? And I'd put reach in that um, in that category. I mean, among the most innovative charter schools uh, that I've seen and 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 documented. Um, what do you see as the future of the, this movement in particular in Southern Oregon? I think it's going to continue to grow. Families are pulling their kids from the traditional brick and mortar settings. Uh, you know, there's different things, ideas that are being brought forth that families don't particularly align with. And so they are pulling their kids and wanting that independence. And I, I see this to continue to grow. Um, you know, the traditional school setting is still using the same model that they've been using for 70 years now, right? And it's not changing. So until public education can change and innovate, families are going to continue to pick something different. So this might be a tough question for you to answer, but if uh, listeners and viewers of mine are thinking about becoming an education entrepreneur, would you recommend they look at becoming a charter school founder or would you say no, you know, be a micro school founder or work more in the kind of independent space? I guess what are sort of the the pros and cons of each of those opportunities? In, I, I would recommend any and all of them, if they have the fortitude. It, as someone said this to me not too long ago, you need a champion. And so 
to be able to persevere and to continue making this forward movement, you have to be willing to stick it out over the long haul. The first time I made an attempt of opening the charter school was in 2005. And so I hit the wall and so do others, many others. And typically what they do is they kind of give up. And if you, it's something you truly believe in, you can't give up. You've got to keep being the champion and keep rallying and pulling people around you. I <clears throat> sometimes I use the analogy of Moses where he, you know, during the battles, he'd had to have somebody hold his arms up, you know, and as soon as his arms started dropping, they'd start losing the battle. And then when he had others to put his arms back up, they were winning again. I, it probably sounds a little silly, but it, you know, you have to be willing to keep pushing forward. Currently, I know of one one of my former teachers is starting a charter school in the small little community of Cave Junction and the Rainbow Academy you went and visited. That was also a former teacher from Reach. So that's the other piece that I feel is really important is I don't have to have all the knowledge and do everything within Reach. Me to raise heroes, raise people up and give them the skills to they, they can go out and innovate. And that's part of my role now is helping and encouraging and building those people up. Oh, it's really, really such an exciting time in education, I think in Oregon and in elsewhere. Great to see that former students of yours are uh, off building their own new programs. Um, so, you know, what advice would you have for these aspiring education entrepreneurs uh, who want to go off and either create a new charter school or a new private school, micro school learning pod? What would you say to them? Um, be okay with things being messy. Be okay with that. Uh, when you're a perfectionist and or, you know, that having that entrepreneurial spirit, you have a vision of what it should look like, but you have to be flexible and willing to change. Uh, you know, when you're moving the ocean liner, it's, it takes a lot more space to make that move. But when you're in a jet boat, you can move really quickly. So I use a lot of... Um, analogies and visionaries so that you can kind of get the idea of what it is, what it takes to be able to start a charter school, to start a micro school, to be able to start a pod. You just have to be flexible. Yeah. And be okay with, with failure and setbacks too. I mean, I think oh. it is really interesting that you mentioned that you started off um, in 2005 and it didn't go as planned and you kept with it. And then 2011, finally reach came to be, and now here it is so successful. So yes. that perseverance, uh, is such a crucial part of being an education entrepreneur. Cecile, yeah. I wonder, um, what you think about the future of American education more generally, you mentioned how it really hasn't changed much at all in 70 years, at least, uh, yeah, at least. <laughs> that, that we, uh, are still really kind of stuck in an outdated one size fits all model of schooling. Do you see that changing or what do you see as sort of the larger landscape of education in the coming years, particularly in light of some of these newer and innovative models? I think some of the districts are listening and I think some of the states are making some enormous changes. For example, Arkansas, where they have a voucher system. Florida has a voucher system. Um, you know, I know that they've tried to do that in Oregon and every time it's failed. Uh, it's just something that it, it depends on the state you live with in but you need to not give up being a voice. It, it's, it's being able to continue to make those changes. I think public school will change at some point in time, but I think it's, it's the ocean liner. It's gonna take a long time to get them to change. Yeah, there's certainly been a lot of um, education momentum over the past few years, not only with entrepreneurship, but like you mentioned, with school choice policies, uh, mm -hmm. particularly universal education savings accounts that are being passed in, in several states and um, other kinds of school choice policies like tax credit scholarships and yes. 
uh, and just general uh, education tax credits. So uh, good to see that. I think as parents are demanding change uh, Mm -hmm. and policymakers are listening uh, and you're really a part of that as someone who is running a charter school and kind of has to deal with the policy angle, but also, you know, have that true entrepreneurial spirit. So it's just wonderful to see what you've built. What do you see over the next five years with REACH? So I think it will, over the next five years, REACH will continue to grow. Uh, they just passed another legislature in Oregon that will limit where you can open. So our sponsor is Rogue River. We were able to, in 2019, purchase a building inside another school district, which was allowed through law. Now they've changed that and we won't be able to do that anymore. So what I see is we're going to have to continue to be innovative because we don't have any more building space. And as we grow, we're going to be limited. So how do we create and make sure there is true education without walls? And that's a hard one, like I said, for people to understand. And I see that that's going to continue to happen in Oregon in within reach. We're going to continue to look at innovative ways to do school. And school does not have to be sitting in a classroom, sitting at a desk every day. It is out in your community and being highly involved and visible within the community. And that's what I see for REACH. Mm. And continuing with that permissionless innovation strategy of, you know, barriers come your way and regulatory hurdles, and you find a way creatively to adapt to those and continue to serve families in Rogue River. So kudos to you for that effort. Cecile, what is the best way for my listeners and viewers to learn more about REACH and connect with you? So the best way is to go to our website. It's reach-school.org. And right there, you can send an email to me. You can um, send any kind of questions and they will get to me. Just go to our website, reach-school.org. Cecile Enright, thank you again for being on the Liberated Podcast. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share. Uh, I just so respect the work you're doing also. And thank you for everything you're doing, Carrie.